All right, hey everyone, welcome to the first community meeting that we've had in, a, in quite a while. And um, looking forward to telling everybody everything that we've been up to and hearing everybody's uh, feedback. So quick agenda, we're gonna give a status roadmap and then uh, kind of let folks speak up about uh, their use cases and you know project direction. And then we're finally gonna uh, go through some of the cool technical things that have been hap happening. So yeah, just I think a lot of the people here are already on Discord, but if you aren't, then you can go there. And we also have a forum, which is less active, um, which is part of the LLVM uh, discourse uh, as an incubator. Okay, so what has happened in the last five months since we had a community meeting? Well, first I want to give everybody like an updated um, answer to like, you know, what is Torch MLIR? So Torch MLIR is fundamentally normalizing the entire PyTorch sort of uh, e ecosystem into a program representation that we can then provide to compiler backends so that they don't have to reinvent all these integrations. So right now we have these th three integrations. We'll talk more about Torch Dispatch and Lazy Tensor Core um, later on. Um, we have these three, and then they kind of get all pulled into one MLIR uh, dialect called the Torch dialect. And then we, you could, of course, always consume that, or, or more likely you want to accept uh, one of the predefined lowerings that we have, which are either through Linalg or through Tosa. And then that can feed into your backend. And so basically just we're solving this like, you know, n times m problem for you. Uh, yeah, so so the big probably the biggest milestone since the last community meeting was the bird inference uh, was is running end to end now, and that the Tosa backend is able to run a ResNet inference. Uh, and additionally, the backwards pass ops for ResNet and BERT are ninety or like ninety five percent done. Uh, this includes some pretty interesting ones, so. Uh, it's quite a bit of work ha happening uh, to make that happen. Uh, just some quick statistics here. So we've been kind of averaging one to two commits a day, maybe you know about 600 minus 400 lines of code. Uh, and you can see here kind of the breakdown of, of contributors. So Nod has been contributing a lot, and then Google Arm, and then Xilinx, Rebus, and other folks are starting to to pitch in and that those contributions are really appreciated. Actually, even though Cerebrus here is only like four, uh, you know, like four commits at the time that I did this last week, but they're bringing up a major new feature. And so that's really, really exciting. And we'll talk about that later on. Um, yeah, so just this off the top of my head, what we kind of have been thinking is coming next is so uh, there's 25 models from Torchbench that I think we can reasonably uh, cover. And so that should get us some really good kind of industry standard parity for a lot of workloads. Um, of course, we're gonna keep improving the TOSA support, primarily focusing on BERT. And we really want to kind of get the, the project into a bit more of like a production mindset. And so uh, we really wanna co-design with an early adopter um some like an actual like okay you really want to use torch mlir for real not like some hacky script that's pulling things together and so we're uh, eerie is really interested in that and so uh, we'll be working with them very closely to to do that and then um hopefully we'll have just like docs apis it's like kind of everything is going to be like and you just pip install this and you're off to the races um and um, and lastly, uh, we'll talk about this later in the presentation, but Lazy Tensor Core and the Torch Dispatch uh, based eager mode are, are coming online. And so uh, we want to make those more available. So one of the reasons those are really interesting is because those are the Torch script backend is unable to, um, in a sense, give us training graphs because it doesn't do sort of the autograd and just sort of technically speaking, like when you call backward, it just says backward. It doesn't actually like show you the graph of like the backward graph uh, directly. And so uh, we've been 
there's a few approaches to to getting those backwards graphs. One is through FunkTorch, but then Lazy Tensor Core and the sort of eager mode is going to um, really make that uh, a reality and really run end to end. Um, and I, I'm going to give you folks um, opportunities to to comment on all this in, in a little bit. Uh, yeah, so the, the community, um, we're now going to have the community meetings regularly scheduled. So the first Mondays of the month is going to just be like a kind of a general community meeting. We're going to try to not go into like really deep project technical details for the, um, you know, like technical design decisions and things like that. Um, you know, it'll be kind of the, this kind of like more high level overview feedback on project direction. And then I'll send out the invites soon, but I kind of want to do like a Monday kind of developer hour. So you get folks are debugging something or or just want advice, like have kind of a high bandwidth communication on like, oh, how should I design this? Then we can have those discussions like really, really efficiently. Wow. Um, so I'm looking forward to, to do that because I mean, kind of now have a pretty substantial group of, of you know, active developers. So I'm really excited to, to to be, uh, you know, interacting like, like really seriously with everyone. All right, um, I'm gonna hand it off to Anoush, who's uh, gonna give us an update on what Nod's been up to with Torch MLIR. Hey, thanks, Sean. Uh, so yeah, so um, we'll just give a quick high-level overview. Nod, um, we're we're just gonna be super focused on ops, ops, ops. Um, our um, goal is to try and get like stay focused on the PyTorch uh, ecosystem, but kind of bring in all the benefits of uh, an MLIR based like um, you know backend. Uh, so try and get um, you know like uh, Sean mentioned the like twenty five plus models that we have on target to validate. Uh, that's going to be our next uh, set. Essentially, we want to have all of um, Torchbench, uh, you know, covered at some point. Uh, this way, if you have anything that's working in "quote unquote" regular PyTorch, you should be able to lower through MLIR to, through Torch MLIR uh, to, to your backend of, uh, you know, choice. Um, so, as you've seen in the commits uh, that Sean mentioned, you know, we we that's that's our primary focus: just the decomposability of uh, Torch uh, into MLIR, Torch ops into MLIR, um, and then. We have downstream customers um, who we kind of support with Shark, and Shark is what we, um, you know, kind of package up Torch MLIR, Eevee, uh, some performance enhancements uh, across the stack, and then, um, you know, some of our code gen uh, and petition search, so that it's, uh, you know, not just code generation search, but also how do you uh, split it across like multiple devices, etc. We package all of that into. Um, and, and easy to use interface, uh, and that's Shark. Uh, all of that is open source, um, except for the code gen search, we're still in the process of getting uh, things into, um, into compiler gen. Uh, but uh, the, the key there is, you know, if you're doing ops for like generality, um, the next one is like, we wanna do benchmarks to make sure that we can outperform uh, you know, existing uh, runtimes. And so we kind of take it all the way down uh, and make sure that we, uh, we we are good. And so we published some results on uh, Intel, uh, Alga Lake outperforming MKL, NVIDIA um, outperforming, you know, um, uh, the runtimes that run on NVIDIA, uh, and then Apple M1 too. And all of this is coming down through Torch MLIR, and that's, what, that's one of the benefits of what we're going for, which is decomposable um, into MLIR, um, you know, uh, dialects that can then target various uh, hardware. Um, we do have a lot of um, customer deployments, uh, which is where we started this whole, um, you know, focus uh, with Touch uh, You know, the Risk Five uh, accelerators that are custom VLAW accelerators. Um, there are new ones that are coming up that are still in like emulator and simulator stages, um, and uh, you know, there are uh, novel architectures, uh, mixtures of uh, SIMT, SPMD, you know, just. Um, like new stuff, right? Anyone who's building anything new uh, and needs a, a stable ML 
uh, surface to target uh, is it just touch them layer makes sense. And so that's what we've been pitching. So it's not just um, you know chips that have shown up, chips that are being designed that are out uh, a year or two are also co-designing with Touch Malayar, which, which makes it very exciting. Um, and, um, and then we, we have uh, you know, customer deployments from edge, um, really small edge devices, uh, all the way to you know, large uh, supercomputer scale. Um, we did, um, uh, we, we, are, uh, we have a whip integration for PyTorch Lightning. Uh, the idea being we want to decouple uh, the the math from the system side uh, again so it's a it's an integration of uh, you know Tosmal AR plus ED plus uh, essentially Shark um, and then we're also looking at how we can seamlessly integrate into Deep Speed and FSDP um, either directly in there or uh, or provide an equivalent interface um, so that we can kind of compile a billion trillion parameter models. Uh, through touch on IR and and then execute them on the back end. Uh, obviously, since they're all decomposable and and um, you know fusible at uh, at at a very late stage, uh, it uh, you know it that's the right way to do uh, large model training. And so that's an exciting area that we're uh, starting to explore with uh, touch on IR. Uh, and I'll hand it off to Sean. And whenever there are any questions, when uh, Sean may open up for questions, happy to take any questions. Yeah. So um, yeah, just the next slide. If you want to introduce yourself and what you're doing with Torch MLIR right now, I know Anoush covers a lot of the people here, um, but uh, you know, feel free to sort of raise your voice and say you know what you're doing with Torch MLIR. Like what, what's working well, what could be improved, and, you know, is anything blocking you from using it? Um, so does anybody want to uh, to bite on that? All right, maybe not. All right, well, I guess I'll take that as uh, everything is working perfectly then. Um, <laughs> really? Or, 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 sometimes the customers also may yeah, know. I think maybe the question work. might have been better or passed a little later to the chart, perhaps. <laughs> Sorry, what was but, that, Suraj? No, I mean, this particular slide could have been asked a little later to the chart, because right now I think people just want to get a sense of what the current status was. OK, all right, sure, we can come back to it. Mark, did you have something that you were saying? Yeah. Well, I was just saying, what is blocking us? Well, not much. We're just fixing it. So you'll hear about what Cerebrus is doing uh, in a little bit. So we're okay. here, but we didn't want to like, yeah. You'll okay, hear more later. Sure. All right, let's go in there. This is then now that we get to the fun stuff, all the technical updates. Um, so we have actually quite a few things here. Uh, so uh, yeah, uh, Antonio and Henry, do you want to? Uh, present on L LTC. Hi, Sean. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Wonderful. Uh, so, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Antonio. I'm one of the machine learning engineers at Cerebrus. Uh, and we've been bringing up the new Macy Tensor Core front end. Uh, and well, it's a front end for Torch and Malara, but it is effectively a new back end for PyTorch. Uh, and yeah, so upstream PyTorch uh, is developing. Uh, the new front end lazy tensor core, uh, which is uh, an upstream, uh, an improved version of the previous lazy execution model, which was introduced in PyTorch XLA. Uh, and that's something that uh, we at Cerebrus have, have been using for quite a while. Uh, but now that they've uh, landed a lot of the stuff in PyTorch Master uh, and a lot of this uh, similar functionality now exists in just vanilla PyTorch as opposed to uh, uh, the XLA uh, repository, uh, we're, trying to make use of that. Uh, and because we also use MLIR in our backend, we thought uh, contributing the Torch MLIR lazy backend uh, to the Torch MLIR uh, repository would be a, a great uh, contribution. Uh, so the use case for the lazy tensor core uh, would be to uh, compile PyTorch graphs uh, in Python-driven workloads. Uh, as many of you know, PyTorch is uh, normally eagerly executed, but that's not uh, uh, 
uh, an execution mode that uh, we at Cerebra support. Uh, we require lazy execution uh, and compiled graphs. Uh, so uh, that would be uh, the primary use case here. Uh, at the moment, we're currently working with uh, some people in, on the PyTorch team to improve their uh, core infrastructure and to integrate TorchMLIR into their extension points. Uh, uh, but before we started to work on this, uh, they uh, only uh, supported the TorchScript backend. Uh, so there were a lot of uh, different edge cases and different scenarios that they uh, didn't really consider and uh, didn't factor into the design. So we're working with them to improve it uh, as a whole. Uh, and yeah, so so uh, we've been working on that. Uh, and Lazy Tensor Core is still an experimental uh, uh, feature. Uh, it's not even entered beta phase yet. Uh, so while that's still not fully uh, uh, landed in master, we're doing all the integration on a branch in TorchMLR to kind of avoid breaking uh, any uh, work on the main branch. Uh, and at this stage, we actually do have a working proof of concept kind of available for the TorchMLR LCC backend. Uh, it doesn't actually run anything just quite yet, uh, but uh, it can directly lower PyTorch code into MLIR instead of going through, uh, say, TorchScript or any other backend. Um, Sean, next slide. Yeah, before we go to the next slide, I just wanted to say thank you so much, Antonio and Henry. You guys have been doing a really great job of you know bridging you know, a, an experimental feature with, you know, uh, a, a sort of a, a pretty early stage project like Torch MLIR and working with both projects to really, you know, co-design the, the support. Really, really great work. Yeah, uh, so the text is a little small, but uh, I hope you guys can kind of see and read that. Uh, so it's a very simple example. Where we're just uh, creating tensors X, Y, and Z and doing X divided by Y plus Z. Uh, and ultimately, uh, I guess kind of like a high level diagram of what that looks like uh, uh, conceptually uh, would be the graph uh, in the center here. Uh, but what this actually outputs uh, with the lazy backend would be the MLI that you see in comments here. Uh, so this, this is a, so a very kind of primitive example, I guess, with no backwards pass, but uh, we have tested it with backwards passes. So we are able to get full training graphs. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, yeah, so uh, some of the future work that we ha have in mind for Lazy Tensor Core is first to add shape inference information uh, as uh, uh, it's not currently entirely supported by uh, Lazy Tensor Core. Uh, so we need to work with the PyTorch team on that. Uh, and once all the Lazy Tensor Core components land in PyTorch Master, we can kind of begin to merge the TorchMLR and Lazy Backend components off of the staging branch um, onto the main branch for everyone to kind of uh, start playing around with uh, and start using. Uh, and as part of that, uh, we're integrating and testing uh, the lazy backend with vendor hardware. Uh, in this case, it's Cerebrus hardware, uh, but uh, we'd be happy to uh, work with an, uh, uh, other vendor hardware as, as well. Anoush, is that something you guys would be interested in helping to integrate with? Oh no, definitely. Um, this this is uh, you know th this this is great. I think uh, from the Nod side, like the initial prototype that we did, it was still very early, uh, and that's why we had to go through uh, the Tot script and and AOT autograd path, uh, and we're using that as the plan of record right now until we get uh, you know until we get th this and and this is great. And like Sean mentioned, I think this is uh, um, this is where we want to be. Uh, eventually, right? So, um, and and any way we can help with there are customers that we are supporting downstream um, that I think uh, just like you know uh, what you're doing, the more customers we enable, they can also you know drop in one or two more people, and, and suddenly we'll we'll get like a critical mass in, you know um, on on this path down. Um, there are some hyperscalers also that I think would be interested. Um, so, which which means like you know again, uh, resource wise, you, we we can enable a lot of uh, uh, customers. The easiest way to look for that is like all the forks of Touch XLA. Uh, you know, just like how Cerebras had it. You know, there are others who who've been doing the same thing and repeating the same thing with more people. I think uh, what you're doing kind of provides like the uh, you know landing pad for all those customers to kind of uh, not go after a fork of Touch XLA. 
uh, and, and land on your work. But this is just amazing work and we can, we'll, we'll help in any way. Um, I, I think there are a couple of um, things that we noticed. I think Gaurav or Prashant may know more, but uh, some of the ops that we did see through the uh, LTC touch script path uh, for backwards pass were a little different from what we got from AOT Autograd. Um, and AOT Autograd also has uh, decompositions that we use right now <coughs> with the Jose. We're working with him to upstream those into AOT Autograd. So some way, uh, you know, there'll be some path that we should kind of normalize that even if you go through the LTC path, could those decompositions be handled uh, in the LTC path too? Uh, so that irrespective of whether you go down, you know, which way, the, the ops um, should be the same and the touch of layer we could have uh, you know, eventually be the same. Yeah, I think after the work that I did with for the shape stuff, which I, I I'll talk about later, I think I have a an idea for how we can handle the decompositions natively, um, no matter which path we go down. Awesome. Yeah. So thanks, Antonio, Henry, and all of you folks at Cerebrus for contributing this work and getting it started. One thing, um, just while, while we are on the uh, uh, LTC uh, thing, um, and Sean, uh, let me know what your thoughts are too. I, I think uh, the, if the if the integration doesn't break our TorchMLA tests, it's okay to be in master too, right? Uh, unless the LTC work in master is going to break master somehow, uh, because I think Antonio and team are already dealing with an experimental branch there, and then you have a branch here. Um, you know, it, if if it doesn't break anything else, I'd say we should just have it in our master. Um, then that way others can who are, who are using TouchMLIR will also be able to try out LTC and give feedback to Antonio uh, without having to, you know, context fix that too. Just, just some food for thought. Right. Uh, so the reason we decided to do it on a staging branch and not on uh, the main branch is because we're working off of the staging branch on PyTorch instead of PyTorch nightly. Uh, so that's something that would kind of break because the, the build for the lazy tensor staging branch require or is dependent on things uh, that don't exist in PyTorch master yet, right? Uh, yeah. But hopefully right. soon, hopefully soon, uh, uh, they're working on landing uh, the final pieces, I guess, into master. And then at that point, we, we should be able to okay. move everything into the main branch. Perfect. Uh, all I'm saying is we, we have more flexibility to reduce the burden that you're carrying. Uh, so even if only when you build in TorchMLIR mode, your PyTorch needs to be built on this branch. And, and as long as it doesn't break um, the other things, you can start you know, decoupling it, just if it makes your life easier. Uh, yeah. Cool, that's great. All right, so um, a, a, lot le a lot less fancy than what we have building in LTC. Um, she, I don't think Max is here, but uh, Max right. uh, Leventhal is here. Not yet, but um, let me. Uh, he may have missed. Uh, uh, he just messaged me a little earlier, but yeah, we should just continue with. Um, we can we can talk about you can talk about it. Okay. Yeah. So um, so PyTorch introduced this new functionality called Torch Dispatch, which is kind of this like Python level hook that you can use to intercept the dispatching process in a really fine-grained way. Um, I have a link here to one of um, Chili or Horace Hayes, um, you know, write-ups on it. It's actually pretty cool. Um, right now, they get, I, I don't really know what to call it, but it's like, you know, sort of the torch dispatch-based eager mode. We're using this functionality to sort of build per op sort of, uh, you know, graphs and compile them, which is not the most kind of efficient mode in a lot of senses uh, and for many types of devices but i think that you know there is a really in, some really interesting um characteristics to this so in particular that kind of what with a back end that kind of has pretty good cpu gpu cogen it should kind of in theory be like match what uh the sort of uh, default pytorch kernel library does which is kind of uh you know really uh uh, you know, interesting prospect to not have to have all that handwritten code. Um, so the cool thing about this is that it, like, if we don't support an op, it can fall back to PyTorch, so it kind of always works. Again, from a performance perspective, that isn't great. 
um, but it kind of lets us get the compiler in the um, Oh, here's Max. Max, are you there? Yeah. Max, do you yes, want to? Yeah, sorry. I don't know how I got my wires crossed. Uh, yeah, no so, worries. Yeah, so um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, Egan Road for Torch MLIR. The idea here is we want to bring the wonders and goodies of Torch MLIR to people where they are. This means data scientists who uh, you know aren't super familiar with the compilation flow with compilers maybe in general. Uh, they're using Torch, PyTorch generally uh, in eager fashion. That means the traditional conventional PyTorch run by define uh, strategy. And so we're going to emulate this. We're going to essentially inter intervene in the PyTorch dispatcher. I don't know how many people are familiar with how PyTorch dispatch works. But anyway, intervene in the PyTorch dispatcher. Um, uh, and as it's about to dispatch to the PyTorch kernels that are implemented and maintained by the PyTorch team, we're going to just completely um, subvert that and compile them through Torch MLIR. So this, for the you know the time being, means dispatch, uh, sorry, compile op by op. So we're not getting any of the power of like whole graph analysis. Uh, we're not going to do any transformations. We're not even doing something as simple as loop transformations just yet. But it, it you know it works. So. Uh, you can, it's a drop-in replacement for PyTorch. All it takes is wrapping your input tensors in this little class that we have called Torch MLIR tensor, uh, and it works uh, as far as, you know, insofar as the ops that people are using in their models are supported by Torch MLIR. So uh, we have some demo scripts, we have some documentation. Uh, it's being developed. I got lost and forgot about this meeting because I was uh, started the extension to GPU and stuff like this. Um, so currently, right now, it only works for CPU and on the ref backend, but you know, shortly it'll work on all the things that you want it to work on. Cool. Uh, do you want me to go to the next slide, Max? Yeah, sure. All right. Yeah. So this is a you know this is like a diagrammatic, simple explanation demonstration of how it works. That Torch MLIR tensor is what I alluded to. Just wrap your inputs, pass it through. Here, there's no model. You're just depending on the um, the method overload for the uh, you know division and uh, addition operators. But if you have a model, just pass it to the operator. It'll work through the. Uh, it'll work as soon as you put it through the forward. I mean, so the the forward method will be called automatically because models are callables and stuff like this. And yeah, so there's you know there's no there's no like picture here in this diagram of oh we pass it off to. Uh, the MLI compiler stack, but that is what's happening um, in the guts. Yeah, when I saw this, I was like, uh, you know, kind of amazed that, you know, 100 lines of Python code or, I don't know, maybe 300 lines of Python code would suddenly make this all work. So kind of, it's pretty interesting. Yeah, I'm not I'm not sure who's on the meeting, like, because I'm late, because I got you late, and everybody knows that. Uh, but the big shout out to, you know, first of all, Sean and Anoush and everybody else on the team who, you know, predates my starting to hack on Torch MLIR. But in particular, Horace, he and Brian Hirsch uh, were really, like, helpful. So I, I, I don't know if they're on the call, but these are two engineers on the PyTorch team that basically manage, you know, they help me, and uh, it's the PyTorch's team, uh, like, construction of the dispatcher that made this really possible. So there's a really easy way to hook in the dispatcher, and that's what made it a lot less pain than it could have been. So that's why it's a 300 lines of Python instead of 3,000 lines of C++. Yeah. Uh, so th this is just a quick uh, opinion, you know, because we have lazy tensor core and torch dispatch, so it's kind of like can be confusing, um, you know, why do we have both? And so I think my view is that lazy tensor core is sort of, in a sense, the more general thing, because it kind of compiles whole graphs. And you know, a single op is sort of a special case of a whole graph. Um, and I think it comes down to sort of non-technical factors at this point. So the lazy tensor core, you know, like we were discussing, there's a lot of sort of project level dependencies and uh, you know, build and things like that. Whereas the the torch dispatch. Um, eager mode is sort of just works like it passes all of our tests um, yeah, already and so it it's a very 
uh, it, it's kind of a, a starting starting the problem from like two different sides. And you know, I think they'll kind of meet in the middle somewhere. Um, I think one of the cool things about the um, the eager mode is it kind of sets a baseline performance for us to you know kind of measure improvements from you know whole graph compilation uh, some devices require the whole graph compilation and so you know it's not really a, a big deal you know there's not really a point of comparison there uh, but you know for cpu and gpu uh it's uh kind of gives us a, a place to to start from start building up back end inter interfaces etc um and i think it's really interesting <laughs> I think uh, Anoush, this was your idea, right? It's like, what if we can have, you know, upstream PyTorch, like not even need to maintain the A10 library? Like, what if we could just, you know, with an appropriate backend, uh, you know, just compile, uh, you know, all the convolution operators and everything. I think it's, that's a really interesting idea. Who knows if upstream PyTorch will bite on that, but um, it's kind of interesting to prove that out. And then um, one of the things that Horace was, actually talking about with the torch dispatch thing is that actually you can implement sort of lazy tensor core like things on it um there's some examples in in some of like very trivial examples in in um some of like the they're kind of like model they're like tensor subclass zoo repo but uh i i think it, it's potentially allows some like quick prototyping on like different approaches different like architectures for doing the tracing and stuff um, so that's kind of speculative, but uh, I think just having the like foundation in place to sort of explore some of these like high risk, high reward ideas is definitely worth it. Uh, yeah. But yeah, hopefully yeah. six. Oh, oh, sorry, Anush. No, no, something um, else. Uh, yeah, uh, sorry, it's gone. Uh, I can. Yeah, that was me. A question we have internally is what is the stability and maturity of the web's deployment paths in relation to the web's options here, like the lazy tensor core or the touch dispatch mode, because if the deployment path itself is not really made sure, that might kind of affect our prioritization of choosing which of the particular mode to spend more resources on. So I think from the TOSA perspective, neither of these modes should be any work for you. It should just be they give you the MLIR dialect and, you know, you lower that. So hopefully it's transparent for you. Yeah, I, I think the, the goal, uh, Suraj, is um, what about accelerators? Uh, I mean, we're, people are building accelerators that are fully capable. Um, and today, something that we don't even try to solve is can PyTorch natively run on that, right? Um, which is if it, if it supports all the operators, can why can't the development flow be on that hardware uh, why does the development flow have to either fall back to a cpu or to a gpu and this work uh, when when i uh, spoke to max max when he was in the compiler team at, at facebook um we uh, kind of like understood that this helps us at least pave the path and kind of research uh, a path out to like hey it's pytorch there's no implication of A10 Kudin uh, something or A10 Rockum something or uh, MKL DNN something, right? Um, everything has to be hosted on our backend, our backend being any of our vendors who are on the uh, Torch MLIR backend. Uh, and, and, and we are uh, getting to, I think there was some interest from, uh, I think maybe Cerebras too earlier um, on the eager mode path. So essentially we just want to provide like if everything had to go through the Torch MLR path, how did it work? Uh, I know, and like Sean mentioned, the LTC path is you know, maturing. Uh, we need to figure out op by op uh, in the LTC path, and that's gonna take some time to figure out. But meanwhile, Max is figuring out, can we use you know, uh, with, uh, with fun touch that's the AOTR to grad at the Pythonic layer and Torch dispatch essentially, uh, the Pythonic layer to provide that uh, capability. If, if the pre in the previous slide, uh, what I was pushing for uh, and and uh, and we haven't gotten there yet, but even that Torch MLIR tensor shouldn't be explicitly called. If one of the vendors wanted to wrap that into Torch tensor somehow, and you kind of imply that that tensor is a Torch MLIR tensor underneath, 
for a development user, it should just be PyTorch. They installed your version of PyTorch that automatically is going through your hardware and everything is working on your hardware. And there's no CPU or GPU uh, eight and ops that I use. Yeah, thanks for that um, context, Anush. Yeah, I'm hoping six months from now we can look back on this and kind of see the see the order in the uh, that right now is not a, as clear, uh, but we're we're looking for it. Um, yeah, Siraj, do you want to talk about Tosa? Yep, of course. Actually, the conversation is a very good point for me to continue on this. So I think most people are familiar with what Tosa is, but as an introduction. Um, in background, actually, we got started with actually developing hardware, um, custom hardware for machine learning, but neural processors and GPUs. So we noticed early on that there were quite a few basic primitives that were in hardware but could be expressed in using some kind of a compiler or just to sort of stabilize the picture of what we would implement in hardware or just in terms of compiler code generation. Because one of the things we saw was that there was a significant amount of uh, pull from the front end and the operators on the front end evolving rapidly and the hardware trying to keep up with all those changes and still make sure that we are able to target something that's going to be developed in the future that needs to be relevant to all the changes of the front end that are occurring in the meantime. So we want a point of stability, sort of interfacing point, and that's how it also came about. The set of primitives from which we can express operators on the front end and basically have the, any backend targeting, whether it's the compiler itself, you do not need custom hardware, but if you're targeting custom hardware, attempt to target that to a particular stable version of Tessa, such that the compiler would simply generate code for that stable version form of Tessa, and correspondingly, the Tessa fronted would generate that form, so that gives us a point of stability, which is quite important for hardware design, and sort of plan out the product life cycle of the whole thing, so, as mentioned, we cover most of the operators, and in the case of most common use cases, especially CV, almost all the major networks we have tried can be fully legalized to tell so. And we're talking about things like inception, mobile nets, rest it, things like that, which we already have. But there are a few networks for which there are some kind of intersecting sharp edges where we are not able to map operators fully. Particularly, there's non-max suppression, which performs a SART operator, and we don't have a SART operation in TASA. There's tap key V2, which similarly does a SART and then pick up the tap key. So these are sort of intersecting points where we can't fully express a particular network single up in that network within TASA, but everything else can be. So TASA is intended to be explicitly versioned for this particular reason. We want to be able to have hardware target a particular stable version. And we also, from the very beginning, had Tesla support quantized data types as well as floating point. This was very important for us. We want to be able to support both. And we use the notion of something called a profile to do that. We have a base inference profile, which is just quantized. Then there's a main inference, which is what you might generally know, floating point and quantized integer. Then there's a training profile. But the floating point inference of the training profiles are in development. And here's something where we have had inputs from the community where somebody would like to come forward and speak about contributing something to the TAS operator set. And actually the TAS specification provides information about how to do that. But if there's further interest, we would like to be able to organize regular some kind of uh, steering kind of meetings together so that we can actually have input on what goes to TAS, uh, how to augment things. So we are open to something like that. So if there's interest, please feel free to reach out to me and we can figure out how to organize a meeting like that. Now, getting back to Dasha Mulaya, the Tesla backend right now, the latest form of the code passes 120 of the end-to-end -end tests, which include rest retaining, and we are really, really close to getting both inference to work. Right now, we're working on the et and embedding operator, which seems to be the uh, last one we need to get in the world. Get the whole thing done. So we might soon be able to get to the point of having both Resnet and both inference working through the TASA backend. And 
the good thing about this, one of the things that helped us really quickly ramp this up was that we have a bunch of Tessa builder functions, which sort of take the invariant form of a particular framework operator and use that to quickly construct the Tessa form of the operator. And that is actually what we had done originally for the TensorFlow legalization to Tessa, and we were able to use that code unchanged to do the same thing for Torch. We should be able to do so for Onyx, which is a parallel effort in progress. So that let us do things a lot faster because we didn't have to write code, which we could all, which is already there. So right now we are focusing on BERT, and we are also trying to push the gap between static and dynamic ship support because almost all the tests we have right now are static only. And dynamic ships really, we are able to legalize things to Tesla, but there are certain sanity checks and the Tesla to knowledge paths that tend to fail. So a lot of the test keys that currently fail right now are due to that. But we are trying to fix that with the Tesla to knowledge one step below so we can get the full end to end path working. And then finally, there's a unit test infrastructure that has helped us a lot. It's essentially a Python test generator. For example, for CUN2D, we have a sort of a bunch of different permutations of the stride value, the dilation value, different weight filter sizes and input IFM sizes. And we generate potentially dozens of tests for every single operator to verify edge cases for each of these legalizations to ensure that the legalization is handling it perfectly. And doing so had enabled us to run ResNet essentially without anything in between. All we did was to drive the individual legalizations, run the unit tests, confirm everything would, and we pretty much threw ResNet 18 at it, and it just worked like that. So it was really helpful. And I'm working with Sean now to try to make this unit test infrastructure part of the Touch MLI button one system. Yeah, I'm really excited to get those tests upstream. You guys are very, very thorough with with that. And I was very impressed when kind of all the unit tests passed and then the end-to-end -end test just passed. <laughs> it just worked. Very, very impressive. Yep. Thanks, Raj. Um, just a quick time check. We have about uh, 15 minutes left. Um, so I think, yeah, you could you maybe do like, your slides in about five minutes and then. Um, yeah, okay. sure. Yeah, so I've been working with uh, Anoush's team on ops lowering. So we've been focusing on uh, op lists gathered from BERT and ResNet training. And um, uh, among those ops, uh, 45 are delivered with E2E testing. And also um, uh, for training models, uh, that, uh, we needed uh, RNG ops. So uh, we also added uh, infrastructure for RNG ops. Um, for the next little while, we will uh, be focusing on enabling the 25 torch ben uh, bench uh, mentioned by Sean and Anush already. Uh, there's a spreadsheet that um, very nicely shows the coverage and all the uh, benchmarks we want to support. So if you want to uh, you are curious about the details, you could uh, check that out. So um, yeah, and the, uh, those benchmarks are like uh, convolution, mostly convolution uh, models and uh, transformer models. Uh, yeah, the next slide. Um, the next slide, please, thanks. Uh, so while we do the ops uh, lowering, we uh, find that uh, some of the very commonly used uh, tensor uh, operations cannot be represented uh, efficiently uh, with um, ML and R upstream, uh, especially uh, linear uh, generic. So that's why we uh, find the need to add a new uh, dialect, TM tensor dialect. Uh, it's uh, for temporarily staging those uh, tensor computation ops that we uh, want to support. Uh, so currently, there are only two ops in the TM tensor dialect. Um, a scatter op is needed for uh, bin count and index put, and scan op is needed for uh, com sum. Uh, so uh, for uh, for reference backend, we only have very uh, basic uh, loop scalar implementation for those ops. So uh, the 
can execute uh, end to end, uh, but the performance is uh, just a baseline, very basic uh, performance. And uh, Eerie backend has uh, better uh, support for those ops uh, like uh, parallelism and vectorization. Um, and uh, we do have a plan to uh, upstream this dialect uh, into ML core in the next quarter so that more downstream object uh, uh, projects can share the efforts and uh, benefit from those uh, tensor computations. Yeah, uh, that's all from me. Yeah, thank you for all the hard work you've done working with, you know, the with Erie downstream to, you know, br bridge this gap and all the work to, you know, help get these things up into the community so everybody can can benefit from them. All right, um, I think uh, I'll, this is what I've been pretty occupied with. So um, the we have a new system for inferring shapes. So just a little bit of context here in TorchScript by default, you don't have shapes for things. And so kind of a user, users have to tell us like, oh yeah, the input to this is this shape. And then it's our responsibility to figure out the shapes of the rest of the program. We used to have a, a pass that um, did this and it was um, becoming a big maintenance burden. So uh, basically, uh, I was actually pretty inspired by the stuff that Elias Ellison was doing upstream in PyTorch. And uh, and so I basically implemented like an MIR, you know, uh, kind of native version uh, of that. So the cool thing is that we actually can write these safe functions in Python and can like literally sh share them with the upstream work that Elias is doing. Um, and so it's been a really good collaboration there. Um, there's, uh, you know, just some of the benefits of this, it, it really makes it a lot easier to maintain. Um, and the shape inference is actually more precise than what we had before, because the shape function is an exact specification of the computation. So, um, you know, there's no need to like, duplicate our definition of like, you know, what's the output sizes of a convolution operator or like a top K operator at all is just, uh, just comes naturally from upstream. Uh, we also model the shape calculations and error guards in the IR really carefully. So we can drop the error guards if necessary, and we can drop the shape calculations if they're not needed after inference. Um, and this is also going to help save a bunch of effort in, in backends, which currently have to duplicate a lot of the um, error checking or, it's, or, or don't do it at all. And we can make that completely consistent. Um, just an example of this, I guess th this slide is a little busy, but like for Conf2D, we literally just call the upstream helper. And it's that simple. It's one line of code. Um, you know, one op that the upstream still hasn't implemented and we're gonna upstream this implementation is constant pad ND. And so this is actually a pretty non-trivial calculation. It's like kind of a list of low high pairs and you have to add it into the shapes and everything. And here you can just write, you know, pretty standard Python um, to, to calculate this shape. And uh, we just have a pass that simplifies all this and gets the exact shapes. Uh, and also it's really, really easy to test. <laughs> you know, it's like that, you know, including the error cases because uh, that's equally important. Um, yeah, so that, that's the end of all the, all, all the updates and the end of the, the presentation. I think we have five minutes. Um, anybody have any topics they wanted to bring up? I wanted to really quickly talk about shape, uh, the shape dialect. So uh, you mentioned, Sean, that I was part of PyTorch. So I was a research PhD student in PyTorch last summer and then through the fall. And we, like you released shape dialect or the, the first parts of it while I was in there. And basically I was writing up the research paper on the stuff that I had done over the summer and was folding it into some of Elias's work. So this is so uh, like props to you because this is exciting for, you know, this is exciting for me at least because you can do a lot of interesting things when you have uh, like analytic ways to compute the shapes you can do. So the thing that I worked on was uh, dynamic 
storage allocation for nets. So you can ahead of time allocate all of the storage for the net. And if you have all of the shapes, that's you know tr kind of trivial. But if you only have symbolic relationships for shapes, you can in fact still do it using some like MIP mixed integer programming solutions. Um, and that's not, it's actually not possible in PyTorch because they don't have good enough coverage. You end up having better coverage in Torch MLIR than PyTorch. And so it's even more feasible for Torch MLIR backends than for PyTorch. So this is like, you know, as soon as I get some space clear off my table, I'm going to try to re-implement what I did in PyTorch using shape dialect. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, and so quick uh, correction, we actually don't use the MLIR shape dialect. That There's a lot of history there. I actually contributed to a part of that. Um, in this case, we actually, the shape functions are written in Python and get lowered into Torch script, yeah. which reuses our uh, Torch dialect. Yeah, sorry, I had, you, we had talked about this, but I yeah, flipped yeah. it just now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so um, yeah, it's kind of like the manifestation of what we were hoping to do with the shape dialect. And in the end, we didn't need a new dialect. Um, cool. any, any other um, topics of, of conversation, especially things related to like project direction or kind of next steps roadmap? Any feedback on that? I have a dumb question about the shape thing, actually. Okay. Um, how does it handle garbage in, garbage out? Suppose they get broken information from chart site. Can you actually verify that? Uh, yeah, so it, uh, the abstract interpretation of the shape functions, you know, like it's not going to crash the compiler. It'll just, you know, you know, if the user provides like a counterfactual sort of situation for shapes, then it just won't will stop propagating through the program. Or like, I mean, it'll like hit an error like when the program actually executes and like safely abort. Great. Uh, Liam, I see your uh, video just came on. Yeah, I did. Yeah. Um, so I was wondering when you were talking at the start about the idea of trying to work towards uh, towards having a, a more stable, I, I guess, doing the first release. Like, I, I guess, mm -hmm. does that mean you would be moving from from trade from tracking torch nightly to to having tracking a particular release torch version as well? That's actually a really good question. I think it's still up in the air. We need to see what downstream users um, want. Uh, Oh, thank you, Marius. See ya. Uh, uh, yeah, so uh, I think we need, we need to just get community feedback on that. Obviously, it'll be more burden on us or the more versions of PyTorch we have to support. But, uh, you know, I think it's doable. It's sort of just a matter of enough, I, I guess, like if defs or the Python equivalent in the code and a, an appropriately complicated CI system. Um, but yeah, very excited and interested to hear like people's requirements. Okay. But we're not quite at that stage yet. I think we really want to um, really work with Erie and you know kind of do like an MVP there. Um, and anybody else who, who wants to um, you know be an early adopter, but you know there are sharp edges and uh, and really kind of show what a, like a nice API and stuff is going to look like there, and then. Then we'll try to roll that, roll those learnings back into the main project and kind of provide some canned integration points for, for everybody else. Excellent. Oh, one, one of the things that, that could be, sorry. Go ahead, Anish. Oh, no, I was just going to say one of the things uh, in this process, too, as we get closer to that, uh, we're, we're having a good um, rapport with the upstream PyTorch side on the LTC side, on AOT autogram on the shape side. So if there are any interfaces that could be abstracted out so that it avoids having to, um, you know, build one version of Torch MLIR per, uh, you know, per release or something, uh, we can try to get some, I mean, I don't think they'll guarantee an interface, but uh, we can try to work around that, just like how PyTorch Lightning works across like so many versions of PyTorch underneath. Um, the goal would be to try and get to that so that we're not like building off of one version of PyTorch and we make enough changes so that when we get to this future point from then on, you know, we are future compatible in an and, and we make all the changes up into PyTorch directly. Yeah, and we, we've built a pretty good relationship with a lot of the upstream PyTorch devs. And so I'm, I'm, I think they'll be pretty uh, willing to, to help us, you know, for on any of our pain points. 
And one other question I had was if anyone had any specific model that they'd like to see. Um, I know, uh, you know, uh, the, uh, the, there are a bunch of other vendors here, but if there is, please let us know. Um, we're just kind of, kind of figuring out what the next 25 models would be. Uh, Sean was like, hey, we should get GANs in. So we, we added a GAN model in. There's like aft for optical flow. Um, so that it's not just just BERT or just convolutions. If you if you have something, uh, I, I, at least we let's try to crank the wheel and see what breaks, so that we know that hey, in Tatum Lab we need some support or whatever else. Uh, but the idea is that we kind of want to replace your workload. I mean, uh, support your workloads that you care about, uh, and so uh, we can get it onto that spreadsheet very easily and knock out ops and support. One of my main thoughts was that I think the spreadsheet is pretty inference focused. Um, my understanding was Cerebra was pretty training focused. So I'm wondering, um, do any of the Cerebra folks have any feedback on workloads you'd like to see? Uh, in general, yeah, we do uh, uh, focus on training as well as inference uh, right now. Uh, we're working on the training part with Lazy Tensor Core, uh, but specifically not at the moment uh, because we're just just trying to get it to work at all, uh, and we can focus on specific workflows later. Okay, yeah, I mean to clarify, the the two supported model families that we are best at are uh, Language and Time Series, which is going to cover BERT as a subset, um, and uh, Vision Models, which are going to use ResNet as a subset. Now, we, we try to handle lots of variants of those types, so Luna, Distill, BERT, um, various other transformer-like things that aren't BERT, but should be similar enough that the model coverage that we have with BERT is sufficient. If we wanted to try something like T5, that's sort of pushing the envelope. Um, it's got relative position embedding, and it's got other ops that are slightly unique. Another also sync problem is that we are looking uh, it's uh, we we we, pro we need to look at it also, but we did spend a lot of time on it. How to deal with control flow and loop, especially for lazy tensor, everything is flattened. So so some of the idea, uh, yeah. So this is something uh, eventually we need to look at it. How to capture the semantic of the control flow and send of flatten out because that will help a lot. And some of the dynamic, for example. Uh, if you have a, a, fully, uh, a model with a variable input size, can you have some symbolic uh, shape and formation instead of uh, a fixed one? Uh, we did spend a lot of time on it, but this is some of the problems that I would love if there are people thinking about it, how to do it, yeah. Yeah, I'm really excited. I think uh, our torch dispatch sort of um, eager mode, I think is, is, is gonna be possible to kind of rapidly try some different approaches. I had some feedback for the lazy tensor core design or like some different ideas for how to maybe help with this, uh, you know, identify repetitive subgraphs and, and control flow yeah. things like that. Um, but I think right now they, uh, they, it wasn't kind of the right time to explore that, but kind of if it's just a matter of writing, you know, 500 lines of Python code over a weekend, then I think we, you know, we can kind of prove out some ideas, some, some interesting ideas and make progress on this. Uh, yeah, so I wanted to say, because it, it maybe it might not have been clear from the rest of the presentation, that the ResNet training and BERT training are um, are definitely locked in. Um, that's even before these next 25 models. So we definitely will support that. And uh, and yeah, like, like Mark was saying, I think hopefully that gives us enough of a foundation on the training side that we can kind of rapidly cover most of the adjacent things. I'd like to yeah, add. We, we are, so we, so, sorry, go ahead. Okay, so uh, I was saying that it'd be useful for us to have sort of generalized pathway from charge vision and maybe something like hugging face, not necessarily just the model we come up with support. I know, for example, that the BERT models come from hugging face, but maybe there should be a, an approach for somebody to just say, I want to pick this particular model from charge vision or hugging face and sort of readily and very quickly tie it into the heavy depot or the end-to-end -end compiler for a discrete run, but that quite, it should be uh, easy to do, I think. Yeah, I am hoping that after this next push to make the API kind of a bit more production ready and nicer to use and everything, it should these should be hopefully like, you know, 100 line scripts in an examples directory and it's just you pip install something and, and off you go. 
do you, you have some downstream code like that? Uh, I just posted a link here. Um, the hope is that this is with um, this gets into Erie Torch. This is in Torch MLIR plus Erie. You can choose any model um, and JIT tracing or AOT, and we'll add LTC to this next. Um, but the idea is that all of this kind of like goes up into Erie Torch or Torch MLIR. But our customers downstream want exactly what you asked, so that's why we have this. So downstream, they'll just pull this and you know, be able to install and run any model. Um, and, and, uh, and the other point on the model, uh, the BERT training is, you know, I think there's one op left that hopefully in the next few days we wrap that up. Uh, but after that, we're, we're you know, uh, focused on trying to get to the larger models. Uh, and so that should also show out some more things like how do we ma manage like a, you know, X billion parameter model. I think right now Albert Albert is like 350 million model uh, parameter model, uh, but uh, downstream customers want to train like 90 billion parameters, something like that. So, uh, so there's going to be a lot of uh, shakeout with respect to that. Yeah, and we're actually working with upstream um, some of the folks on on my larger team, uh, me and some of them on upstreaming to MLIR core, some of the, the better support for you know, external constants and things like that, because it's silly to be. Yeah, that's, the, that's, going to be the, that's going to be the biggest uh, thing for large models. Uh, I, like I, I posted in the ED channel, there was, it's like 700 gigabyte MLIR file that we have to try and compile uh, for the 90 billion parameter model. And, uh, and things fall over in different ways when you're trying to do that, but, uh, but yeah. Awesome. Well, I think we, we can wrap up here. It's been a very uh, useful meeting. Thanks everyone for, for joining and, and giving your feedback. I uh, really look forward to seeing you next month. Uh, should be every Monday at the beginning of the month. All right. Bye folks. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Thanks. Bye.